everyone, and welcome to Faith. My name is Alyssa, and we are so glad that you have decided to spend your morning with us. If you're new, we want to welcome you to Faith Church. We are a community of broken people who are all on a journey towards Jesus. So no matter where you're at, you belong in the family. We would love for you to head to faithauburn.info and fill out a connect card so that someone can reach out to you this week. If you're someone who's ready to partner with us financially, the best way to do that is by going to faithauburn.info and clicking the button that says give. You can give a one-time gift or you can have a scheduled regular gift set up as well. Without your generosity, we could not do what we do. So thank you. Here's what's happening inside Faith Church right now. First is Booth Bash. Today we are throwing a special community event called Booth Bash. It's all the fun of Trunk or Treat, but indoors where it's warm. We'll have costumes, food, music, best of all, candy. There's still time to volunteer, so join us after the service to see how you can help. We can't wait to see you there. Second is baby dedications. One of the first and best steps to take as a parent is the decision to dedicate your child to the Lord. Solomon says in Psalm 127.3, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. Our kids matter. They're a blessing from God. Child dedication is a special service to celebrate and thank God for the gift of our children, but it's also where the church comes together to commit to helping those kids find and follow Jesus. Baby dedications will be held on November 20th during both our 9 and 11 a.m. services, with a family luncheon happening on November 6th. Visit faithauburn.info to register your child today. Third is Gifts for Christmas for 508. If you're new with us, Christmas for 508 is an event that last year provided gifts to over 180 families in need in our community. This year, we're hoping to help over 200 families receive gifts. Here's four ways that you can help. One, take a tag from the giving tree in the lobby. Two, pick gifts from one of our online wish lists on Amazon, Walmart, or Target. Three, sign up your small group to spend one of your gatherings shopping for gifts. Or four, give financially to the Christmas for 508 fund. Head to christmasfor508.com to access the wish lists and learn more. That's what's happening inside Faith this week. Let's continue in our service right now. Hi everyone. Years ago here in town, the Auburn Fire Department held an honors banquet honoring some of those in the department who had gone above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, there was special attention given this particular evening to one firefighter who put his own life at risk, a man who was clearly trying to um, injure himself and take his own life, had gotten out of his car on the busy highway that runs through town, Route 290, and was trying intentionally to get struck and run over by another car. This firefighter was driving in the opposite lane, um, off duty, and without hesitation, jumped out of his own vehicle, grabbed his fluorescent yellow vest, and ran down the side of the highway, waving to motor vehicleists to slow down and stop. Because of the firefighter's prompt and courageous actions, a major accident was averted and a life was spared. The intention of this series is to do just that, to wave a red flag, a yellow fluorescent vest, to take a serious look about what happens after you die. Is there a heaven? Will I go there? Should I be concerned about my place in eternity? The answer to that last question is, Yes, unequivocally, yes, you should be concerned. Now, we established last week this, that everybody lives forever somewhere. We should be very concerned about the somewhere. Christianity presents two choices and two choices only. Today, we're talking about one of them, hell. And here's my firm belief, and I want to state this right up front for you. If you don't accept the reality of hell, you will never appreciate the greatness of grace. The reality of hell should break our hearts, that anyone should have to endure it for more than just a second. But here's the sad reality. In most churches today, hell has become the H word, seldom talked about, rarely referred to. Peter Kreeft, a much respected Catholic theologian from Boston College, puts it this way. 
He says this, of all the doctrines of Christianity, hell is the most difficult to defend, the most burdensome to bear, and the first to be abandoned. He's absolutely right. Whether you're a person today exploring Christianity or, or someone who has been in the faith for quite some time, we all struggle with the notion that a good God would send anyone to a place of eternal punishment. We wrestle with whether it's fair that morally good and upright people would deserve such a fate as eternal torment. Those are the blatant realities of this topic. And yet, we are confronted with a Bible that states very clearly, universally, that hell is a very real place with very real suffering. Jesus spoke a lot about heaven and hell. And in the Bible, Jesus says more about hell than anyone else. And my goal today is not to help you to be a believer in hell, but, but someone who takes this very seriously for yourself and for those around you. Why are we talking about hell? Why are we doing this series at all? We said last week, we put it this way, that what you believe about eternity determines how you live today. If you believe that there is nothing beyond death, then you take a kind of absurd view of life, like Paul quoted to the Corinthians. You know, let's eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. YOLO, you only live once. Or if you believe that you are an accident, that you're going nowhere when you die, then why not live for the now? But if you believe you were created by a good God and for His glory, and you will live somewhere forever with Him, then it will change how you live today. What you believe about eternity determines how you live today. Now, some statistics to share with you today are these. Look at this. 74% of all Americans believe in heaven. Four in 10 believe in a place called hell. But for every one American who believes that they're headed to hell, there are 120 Americans who believe they're going to heaven. This optimism stands in stark contrast to the words that Jesus states very bluntly in Matthew 7, 13 through 14. He says this, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. The overwhelming, overarching word on the street is this, Yes, there's a hell, but it's only reserved for the really rotten. You know, child molesters, rapists, axe murderers, Charles Manson, Adolf Hitler types, the New York Yankees, you know. Only the extraordinarily reprobate and evildoers are deserving of the burning fires of hell. But Jesus intimates here that you actually have to do very little to get to heaven to get to hell, rather. It's the commuter's dream. It's a super highway that's pleasant, undemanding, smooth, and easy because it's all downhill. No, no toll booths, bottlenecks, construction, but a 10-lane highway of openness and expansiveness, maybe even a fast lane for those who like excitement. The way of least resistance. Nothing to hem you in, just toleration and accommodation for all beliefs and behaviors. You do you. Right? Sound familiar? You know, if I were the devil, and I'm not, just to clarify, I would first try to convince people that there was no hell. But if that didn't work, I would try to make them see that it's not such a serious thing after all, that the majority of people aren't going there, that it's only reserved for the few, the foul, the shameful, that everyone would probably just live however they want with no real fear of God then, no real desire to go to church and be with God then and live ridiculously self-centered lives then. They would reject sacrifice. They would be very unlikely to share their faith with anyone, even their own children, because in the end, hey, all dogs go to heaven, right? And bottom line, they'll have no real sense of spiritual zeal because everybody goes to heaven in the end. No sweat. If I were the devil, that's what I would get everyone to, to believe. Oh, wait. Yeah, isn't that exactly where our culture is at? Let me just make it really clear, according to Jesus and Paul, the rest of the New, Te the rest of the New Testament, heaven is not your default destination. It's not. No one goes there automatically or on the basis of their own goodness. 
You know, the good outweighs the bad. The Apostle Paul would put it rather succinctly, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And unless your sin problem is resolved, the only place you'll go is your true default destination, hell. And your greatest temptation, the greatest lie that the enemy would love to have you believe, that you just assume you're going to heaven. It's what I hear most at funerals. I mean, you'd think everyone who has ever died is destined for heaven, but that's not the truth of God's word. Do you see why this is so important? Small is the gate, narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few will find it. You dare not take today a wait-and-see approach to all of this. There's too much riding on this. Over a hundred years ago, the great evangelist D.L. Moody put it this way, that no one should be able to talk about hell with tears in their eyes. I mean, it's that important. So let's examine a quick portrayal of what hell is really like, because I think, I think this will help us even more so to see the incredible choice that's before us. Jesus told a parable that certainly gives great detail into that region of the netherworld. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus teaches a parable about eternity that comes right on the heels of another parable about money, the parable of the shrewd manager who used his earthly position to get ahead, to make a comfortable place, a comfortable living for himself in his retirement. Jesus uses in that parable an a fiortiori argument, a lesser to greater than argument. In other words, if a person in this world uses his money and stature to guarantee for himself a comfortable position in their later years on earth, how much more so should the disciple of Jesus use their wealth and power for the sake of heavenly gain? And Jesus is speaking there directly to the religious Pharisees who felt entitled to their wealth, the, the riches and wealth they were deserved, their religious right, and that it was the sign of the blessings of God. And Jesus argues vehemently against that notion. Right on the heels of that, Jesus launches into another parable with a very similar theme, but with a different twist about those who would use worldly abundance only for their own worldly amusement and what is eternally in store for them. Jesus could not have painted a more bleak and graphic portrayal of what is to come for some. He says this, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. Now, now, Jesus was speaking in a manner that you and I probably don't understand, but his audience, the audience of his day, would. He's saying, in effect, this. He said, hey, this bro, this bro is Kardashian rich. Purple was the color of the rich and famous because it was so hard to manufacture, manufacture the actual color of purple itself. And linen, fine linen, was so expensive that even a small amount could buy enough food to feed a family for a year. And the term lived in luxury meant literally that this rich man feasted sumptuously every single day. In other words, he's crazy rich and he spent all of his money on himself for himself. And at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. And that day, if you were crazy Kardashian rich, you would cleanse your hands before the meal with loaves of bread and the crumbs would fall from your table and your servant would come and take up the crumbs, sweep them up and offer them outside to the dogs. Lazarus desires nothing more than to eat those scraps. Now, here's what's interesting. Many scholars think that this is more than just a made-up parable. The story comes with all kinds of specific details, such as, we know the name of the poor man, Lazarus. This is the only parable that Jesus tells where a person is actually named. And naming Lazarus would suggest that this is more than just a story, but that there was in actuality, a real poor man by the name of Lazarus who suffered in the full view of this rich man, whatever his name was. Now, we're not told how the rich man made his money, but only that he used his wealth for himself. He's not a bad man. He's just blind to the obvious needs that are in his own community. And for that reason alone, 
he will stand condemned before God, condemned for his casual indifference to the person who is right at his door. And the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. This is so rich, so important. Jesus confirms this, that there are two places beyond death. The Old Testament word that is used for death is Sheol. De death had two compartments, Abraham's bosom and Hades or hell. In other places, Jesus uses the word Gehenna for hell, which comes from a real place called the Valley of Hinnom, a valley outside of Jerusalem where they would burn the garbage and the fires there were always burning. Lazarus was carried off to Abraham's bosom. In the Old Testament, there was a character named Abraham who believed in God's incredible, incredible promises for him, for him and his wife, that in his old age, God would bear him a son. And God credited Abraham his faith as righteousness. In other words, it was his faith that saved him. It was his faith that made him right before God. In that moment, Abraham became the prototype of all who would believe in God's saving work, that through simple faith, the just shall be saved by faith. And all who die in faith in the Old Testament prior to Jesus coming are delivered straight away into the bosom of Abraham and stay there until Christ's death and resurrection. But there is another place. Across an impassable canyon lies a place Jesus called Hades, where the rich man could look across and see Lazarus and Abraham together. The rich man went where his money took him. Hades is, in the scriptures, that intermediate state between death and the final judgment, a sort of waiting room until the final sentence is pronounced. And let me say this, this waiting room is a whole lot worse than reading outdated magazines in your own doctor's office. In this passage, we learn some of the vital characteristics, awful characteristics of that other place. It's evidently a place you don't want to be. So he called to him, that is the rich man called to Abraham, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. So what do we glean about hell from this parable? So first of all, Hades is an immediate and irreversible condition. At the moment of death, one is ushered immediately into either heaven or hell with no possibility of repentance or a change of one's condition thereafter. This life now is our moment of decision. We will not have a chance after this life to decide what our eternal fate will be. We also learn that although it will be a very populated place, it will be a place of great uh, isolation. While those who are in heaven will live in this blessed community with one another and enrich fellowship with God and others. Hades, on the other hand, is going to be a place of utter exclusion where you will be left alone with yourself, your thoughts for all eternity. And perhaps, perhaps that's the greatest punishment of all. Friendships, good times won't exist there. It will be a deadly, boring place without God and others for enjoyment. Think solitary confinement ad nauseum. It's also a place where blessings are gone. Blessings will be no more. And what a reversal of fortunes for this rich man. For him, the blessings of God have all but vanished. Everything good, enjoyable, comforting, refreshing, invigorating will be absent because God is absent. When we sing the doxology, what do we sing? We sing, praise God from whom all blessings flow, but in hell, there will be no blessings. Think of earth and the many blessings that you have here, 
a day at the beach, you know, a beautiful walk up a scenic mountain trail, the leaves turning, a beautiful array of all the colors of the rainbow. In heaven, those blessings will be exponentially magnified in heaven. As C.S. Lewis writes in the last chapter of the Chronicles of Narnia, heaven will be the beginning of the great story where every chapter is better than the one before. But in hell, all of God's marvelous blessings will be removed. There will be no comforts. There will be no joy. Put simply, hell is the absence of God. And some of you perhaps remember the singer, maybe you remember them, Marilyn Manson, leader of that heavy metal band that bears his name. His real name is Brian Warner. and was raised in a Christian home, attended a Christian school, but rejected his upbringing and made a name for himself singing very dark, violent songs with a kind of deeply satanic undertone in them. Manson is confident that he'll be going to hell. And laughingly, he wrote this. He says, I'm going to say it would probably be a more comfortable place for me because everyone I know would be there and I wouldn't really be allowed to do anything in heaven that would be any fun. I mean, that attitude is sadly common among many, but terribly uninformed and dangerous. No one will be comfortable in hell. No one will be with others in hell. Hell is not some ongoing animal house party. And no one will have fun in hell. And if the blessings of God are removed, what are you left with? Agony. Always dying, but never dead. Jesus says that the rich man was in Hades and in severe torment. The word torment is the word which means touchstone. It's a black silica stone that was used to scratch on the surface of gold or other pure metals to test their worth, their purity. It came to be known as an instrument of torture. Some people in this life see nothing but pain, suffering, sorrow, and exclaim, you know, life is hell. And, you know, at times it can be. But God is present and active and does shower us with amazing and wonderful blessings. So for the Christian, this life is really all the hell they will ever have to endure. But for the unbeliever, this life is all the heaven they will ever have to experience. And lastly, it will be a place of great regret. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. See, in hell, there will be a full consciousness and a clear memory of one's life and people that you have left behind back on earth. Jesus speaks in another parable that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, which refers to this kind of ultimate and extreme form of regret. Weeping is what you do when you're sad. Gnashing of teeth is what you do when you're frustrated. And hell involves anguish, a deep abiding anguish, knowing you made an eternally terrible mistake and there's nothing you can do about it. And Abraham essentially says no to the request. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. This verse contains kind of this marvelous prediction of things to come in the very near future. Abraham states that even a man rising from the dead will not be enough to convince some. And in telling this, in telling this parable, Jesus is intentionally foreshadowing his own impending death and resurrection and even that that will not be enough for some to believe. Their hardness of heart, their refusal to accept and believe what is right before their eyes will be their own downfall. See, the great question that so many people ask is this, why would a good God send people to hell? Let me clarify this. Hell exists for God to deal righteously with sin. There is in the, within each one of us this sense of right and wrong. We want justice for wrongdoers. We want, we want wrongdoers to be punished. And that sense within us, planted deep within the fibers of our soul, 
It's because God has put it there. God is a just God. As the Bible states, he will not let the guilty go unpunished. He is love, but he's also just. And so oftentimes, the same people who are indignant about injustices done to them are bent out of shape, crying out that it was, would not be fair that God would condemn anyone. But let's be clear. No one will end up in hell who did not choose ahead of time to go there. Someone once put it this way. There, you know, there are two kinds of people. Those who say, thy will be done while on their way to heaven. And another group whom God says over them, thy will be done while on their way to hell. Especially here in America, you practically have to crawl and drag yourself across the cross of Christ, across the stone that was rolled away from the tomb in order to get to hell. There will be no excuse for any living in this day not to have made a decision for Jesus. God has blessed those of us living here in America with a myriad of testimonies of his truth. Churches, rescue stations across our land that preach the good news. No one will be without excuse. C.S. Lewis was an atheist who tried to prove that God didn't exist. But in the process of doing so, he became convinced of exactly the opposite. He became one of Christianity's boldest defenders of the faith. And in clarifying his position about health, he wrote this, Sin is man saying to God throughout his life, Go away and leave me alone. Hell is God finally saying to man, You may have your own way. You may have your own wish. It's God leaving man to himself as man has chosen. God doesn't send anyone to hell, but he will let people go there if they so choose. Hell is something God doesn't do to us. It's more of something we do to ourselves. If people want to live without God for all eternity, he will just remove his hand and say, have at it. C.S. Lewis suggests that if the doors of hell are locked, they're locked not from the outside, but they're locked on the inside. People who go there have chosen to go there. But God offers another way, a way out through Jesus, an opportunity to receive grace, not condemnation. God provides an escape route, and that's why the greatness of grace rescues us from the horrors of hell. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. If there is not a hell, then the cross of Christ means nothing. It makes no sense. I mean, why would God permit his son to come and die an excruciating death if there were not such a heavy weight of sin condemning us to an eternal fiery furnace? I mean, there's no need for a savior if everyone goes to heaven in the end. But there is a hell. And God has given a way of escape. And all that is necessary, all that is needed today for you is that you believe Jesus died for your sins and in your place. God has made it incredibly easy. No good deeds require just simple faith. You don't need to be religious today. You simply have to come to God honestly and confess that, you, confess that you're a sinner. Receive that Jesus and what he's done for you. He willingly took your blame and he offers salvation to you as a gift. That's what grace is. It's a gift that you must receive by faith. The cross of Christ is God's way of making a way and satisfying the just requirements of a holy God. The scriptures say it, that God wishes that none should perish but have eternal life through his son. This is serious, serious stuff today. You dare not wait until you're dead to get a life. You dare not pro procrastinate because you don't know what time your death will be. This is a time-limited offer. Your salvation is being offered to you today by the greatest person who ever lived, who has offered to you the greatest gift you could ever receive. Christ's death on the cross is enough to cancel all of your sin, give you the assurance that you will no longer have to experience an eternal hell, but, but will one day inherit heaven simply by trusting in his name and the work that he completed for you. And once you're saved, membership in God's family can never be broken, never revoked. You know, if a fire broke out in the room that you're sitting right now and smoke began to fill the place that you're in, but through the haze, you could see the exit or the exit sign, you do everything in your power, not only to get yourself out that door, 
but everyone else around you, your children, your family, the people who you love. That's the way out of your burning building today. God has made a way out of the burning building that you're sitting in. But you today, for you today, it starts with a simple prayer that's expressed from a sincere heart. If you today want to be considered among the saved of God and that hell should not be your final resting place, pray from your heart, your heart of hearts, this very simple prayer. Maybe say it aloud with me right now. Lord, I confess I am a sinner. There's nothing I can do to save myself. I need the forgiveness that Jesus alone can provide. Apart from him, there is no hope. I now receive by faith. I accept your mercy and grace as a gift that comes because of your great love, not based upon anything I have done. By faith, I receive you into my heart as the Son of God and as Savior and Lord of my life. From now on, help me live for you, with you, in control. In your precious name, amen. So if you made that decision today, let me say this. Let me invite you to come back to one of our services in person. While you're here, pick up a Bible on our resource table out in the lobby. Start reading it every single day. And especially, especially this, don't forget to watch or be here in person for next week's sermon, which is about the best that is yet to come. Thank you so much for watching today. God bless. It's good to be together with you all. We're going to worship our God together. Would you put your hands together? Woo! Yeah. If you got a testimony, let's sing this out. Come on. And I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven yeah. I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven Yes, my Forever. Well, sing now, come on. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause Greece rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Sons and daughters, yeah, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. Yeah, this is my testimony. From testimony
history wrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified Cause this is my testimony Oh, I'm alive This is my testimony From death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony again for joining us today. We believe that there's a next step for you to take today to further connect with God and with others. If you're new with us, we invite you to fill out a connect card to let us know that you're new. You can do that by heading to faithauburn.info and clicking the link that says connect card. Another simple next step is to follow us on social media. You can find us on Facebook and on Instagram by searching Faith Church Auburn. Another way to further connect is by attending one of our in-person services, which are happening at 9 and 11 a.m. every Sunday morning, with our kids' services happening at the 11 a.m. service. For all signups and next steps, visit faithauburn.info, and we would love to help you get connected this season. Thanks again for watching, and we hope that you have a great week.